Okay, why you should never talk to the police. Let me just spell it out for you. Let me make it plain to all of you. These are the top ten reasons. I, number one, and this really ought to be good enough, contrary to what you laymen instinctively and naturally suppose, it can not help. There is no way it can help. Officer Brooke, you've interviewed thousands of criminal suspects. Have you ever, how many times in your experience, have you approached someone, asked if you could ask them some questions because prior to the interview you had some evidence pointing to his possible guilt? And because of the extraordinary persuasiveness and eloquence with which he articulated his innocence, you said, oh, sorry, never mind. Bad call, my bad, I won't. And you, he talked you out of arresting him. Uh, you know the answer to that. <laughs> never. Never. It never happens. I've often asked other criminal defense attorneys, in all of your experience, have you ever once had a case where you looked back in hindsight and said, thank God my client talked to the police? They laugh at me. They laugh at me. They say, you've got to be kidding me. You cannot help you. You can't talk your way out of getting arrested. And contrary to what you might suppose if you never studied the rules of evidence, what you tell the police, even if it's exculpatory, cannot be used to help you at trial because it's what we call hearsay. Under the rules of evidence, specifically Rule 801D2A, if you want to look it up, uh, everything you tell the police, as the saying goes, can and will be used against you, but it cannot be used for you. From time to time, I've known attorneys who tried to call to the stand a police officer and say, Officer, would you tell the jury what my client told you because what my client told him is actually good for my case? If you tried that at trial, the prosecutor will object that it's hearsay, and the judge will agree. The police will not be allowed at your request to tell the jury what your client told him, no matter how good it may be for your case. It cannot help. Number two, obviously one of the most obvious. If your client is guilty, as many of them are, but even if he's not, even if he's innocent, he may well admit his guilt with no benefit in return. You don't got to admit your guilt the first time they come by to meet with you. In federal court, 86% of all defendants plead guilty at some point before trial. Number three, even if your client is innocent and he denies his guilt and almost entirely tells the truth, odds are good he will easily get carried away and tell some little lie or make some little mistake that will hang him. So he goes in there and he meets with the police. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. I, w I was nowhere near there. I, I, I didn't kill him. I've never killed anybody. I don't have a gun. I've never had a gun. I've never touched a gun in my life. I, I was nowhere near Virginia Beach that, li that, that night. Uh, eh, eh. That last line was a lie. He went over the top. He was getting carried away. He got into this groove. He started saying all kinds of things, almost all of them true, that he knew would tend to exculpate himself then he got carried away and just said one thing that wasn't true, and unfortunately for him, they can prove that it wasn't true. He may be convicted on that basis alone. Because even if your client is innocent and only tells the truth and doesn't say anything that is false, let's assume he gives the police nothing but the truth and he is totally innocent, he will always give the police some information that can be used to help convict him. Always. For example, suppose you tell this to the police. Here's what your client tells to the police in his denial of guilt. I don't know what you're talking about. I, would, I didn't kill Jones. I don't know who did. I wasn't anywhere near that place. I don't have a gun. I've never owned a gun in my life. I don't even know how to use a gun. Yeah, sure, I never liked the guy, but who did? I wouldn't kill him. I've never hurt anybody in my life, and I would never do such a thing. Let's suppose every word of that is true, 100% of it is true. What will the jury hear at trial? Officer Brook, was there anything about this, your interrogation, your interview with the suspect that made you concerned that he might be the right one? Yes, there was. He confessed to me that he never liked the guy. And then the prosecutor put that up in big letters and he'll say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's pretty clear that we've got the right guy here. We've proven that he was in Virginia Beach that night. That's opportunity. And remember, Officer Brook admitted that after extended questioning, he was finally able to get the defendant to admit that he never liked the guy. There's your motive. Motive plus opportunity. Wham, bam. Please. The United States Supreme Court, don't take my word for this. In Ohio versus Ryan, the Supreme Court of the United States said, quote, one of the Fifth Amendment's basic functions is to protect innocent men who otherwise might be ensnared by ambiguous circumstances. Truthful responses of an innocent witness, as well as those of a wrongdoer, may provide the government with incriminating evidence from the speaker's own mouth. See, it's not just some criminal defense attorney telling you this. Even the Supreme Court says I'm right. Allman versus United States, the Supreme Court said more than 50 years ago, eerily prophetic. They said too many Americans, even those who should be better advised, view this privilege as a shelter for wrongdoers. They too readily assume that those who invoke it are either guilty of crime or commit perjury in claiming the privilege. That's not true and it never has been. But it gets worse. Can it get worse? It can. Number five, even if your client is innocent and only tells her the truth and does not tell the police anything incriminating, which by the way is almost impossible to pull this off. I mean, imagine talking to the police for two, three, four hours, and, and somebody like him can't somehow manage to extract from you something that could be used to help convict you. But, but even if you could pull it off, there's still a grave chance that his answers can and will be used to crucify you in a court of law if the police, no offense, don't recall his testimony with 100% accuracy. Even if your client is innocent and only tells the truth and doesn't tell them anything incriminating, and his statement is videotaped, his answers can be used to crucify him. You might say, wait, how can that happen? I insisted, in my insistence, I called the police and I said, look, if you want to talk to my client, you can talk to him, but only if you videotape the whole thing. I don't want there to be any debate between the two of you over what happened. Okay, we'll videotape the whole thing. 
If the police don't recall their questions with 100% accuracy, he'll be convicted on that statement alone. For example, suppose a man goes to the police, they say we're investigating a possible murder, a shooting. And the guy says, quote, I don't know who killed Jones, Officer Brook, with all due respect. I, it wasn't me. I've never touched or fired a gun in my life. You're gambling with your client's life. And police officers can very easily make a mistake like that, just as so many of you did just a few minutes ago, about whether you recalled having heard me say something about somebody actually being shot. Police make mistakes, innocently, inadvertently, unintentionally, any statement, no matter how exculpatory it may seem on its face, can be used to crucify you all by itself if the police are either willing to lie, not likely, or if they just have an innocent misrecollection of the details as to what they did and did not tell you before you told them what you said. All of these, by the way, all of these problems disappear if you take Justice Jackson's advice and say, thank you very much, officer, but no thanks. <laughs> how about this one? Here we go. Now, here's the most surprising of all. I've saved the most surprising one for last. Let's suppose you've got the following scenario. Your client's thinking about talking to the police. He acts like, he says, I've got nothing to hide. They think that I killed somebody in Virginia Beach last night. Well, we're, and, and, this is what, and this is what your client tells you in confidence. I don't know who robbed that store. It wasn't me. In fact, I've got a pretty good alibi. I, I wasn't even in Virginia Beach that night, last night. I was four hours away visiting my mother in the Outer Banks. Unfortunately, no, I did not pay for gas with a credit card. I used cash, and so I've got no witnesses that can prove I was there except my word, and of course, Mama, for what that's worth, which is nothing. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so your client says, so the police want to talk to me, and I want to seem cooperative, so what I'll do is I'll tell them that I was in the Outer Banks last night. Now, there's nothing on its face incriminating about any of that. He's not admitting motive, he's not admitting opportunity, he's not admitting that he was there. How on earth could this come back to haunt us? How on earth could this come back to be used against us? Even if your client is innocent and only tells the truth and doesn't tell the police anything incriminating and the entire interview, questions and answers are, are videotaped, your, even his truthful answers can be helped to use crucify even an innocent man if the police, through no fault of theirs, end up in the possession of any evidence, even mistaken and unreliable evidence, that anything your client told them was false, even if in fact it was true. Let's suppose I, tell, I go ahead and I meet with the police. I think I got nothing to hide. I tell them I was in the Outer Banks last night, officer. How can that be used to convict me? By itself, it cannot. It cannot help at all by itself. But what if I later find out, to my horror, after I put my cards on the table, that they've got a witness, a girl that I went to high school with, an unimpeachable witness, we've never been enemies, she'd have no reason to lie. She swears, she thinks she saw me in Virginia Beach last night, a couple of blocks away from that store, about an hour before it was robbed. Now, her testimony by itself isn't going to help the prosecutor. Hell, if she's all they've got, I'll get this case thrown out before trial. But if, like an idiot, I talked to the police and I told them the truth, I told them I was in the Outer Banks, and now, lo and behold, tragically, it turns out they've got a witness, a false, mistaken, confused, but sincere and credible witness, who could testify that I was here at Virginia Beach, now they're likely to get a conviction. Because what they'll do, I've just turned this cop and this woman into the government's star witnesses. They'll put her, hell, they'll put Officer Brook on to testify about how my client lied to him about being in the Outer Banks, and then... They'll put on this girl, this is a girl who otherwise would have not even helped with their case at all, who will testify, no, that's not true, that was a lie. I saw Mr. Duane's client here in Virginia an hour before the robbery, not so far from the store. By herself, she would not have helped the government in any significant way. But what I have just done, you see, is given them the other part of the puzzle, and now I'm doomed. Just ask them. On the left, we have Martha Stewart. She was the victim, the subject, of an extensive government investigation that was looking into the possibility that she was guilty of violations of certain federal laws, securities laws, fraud kinds of things. They couldn't pin that on her, but they were able to get a conviction because she denied it. Talking to the police and later to some of the shareholders, she said, no, it's not true. I was not guilty. So they charged her with lying to federal investigators. And they got a conviction, and she was sentenced to five months in prison. Marion Jones on the right side, another person who would still be out today if she had always uh, uh, taken the advice that I'm giving you now. She was asked if she had ever used steroids, a controlled substance. And instead of taking the fifth, she said, no, I, I never took steroids when I won those Olympic gold medals. Uh, later on, it turned out that she was lying. She worked out a deal. She pled guilty. She admitted that she was lying. And she, over her strenuous, tear-filled objection, even though she has two young children, was just recently sentenced to prison for six months. The guy who sold her the steroids, the pusher, he got only four months. But she got six months because she lied to the police and said that she did not do it. So my advice to you, Justice Jackson was right. Any sane, competent lawyer in his right mind will always tell every client under all circumstances, I don't care if you're innocent. I don't care if it's the truth. If it's the truth, great. We'll tell the jury all about it. There'll be time enough to put our cards on the table. So keep your mouth shut. Don't answer any questions. Let's take the fifth. You'll be glad that you did. God bless America.